This is Robert Schwenker. I'm one of the organizers for the Blue Sky Community. Today, we will be having a panel on interoperable formats. This is part of a Blue Sky Community Voices series, which began last year in October. We had a series of panels nearly monthly, beginning with identities and personas, as well as discovery and security at, at scale in decentralized storage systems. We looked at blockchain incentivized storage in our Voices 3. And in Voices 4, we had a conversation about reputation and moderation. And last month, we had a decentralized user experience, Twitter Spaces. The goal of these spaces is to help inform Blue Sky and the greater community about designing a durable protocol for public conversation and looking to drive adoption of various decentralized technologies. So with this, I'll pass it off to our moderator today, Kim Duffy. Take it away, Kim. Hi, thank you, Robert. And thanks to everyone for joining. Today, our focus will be interoperability, specifically interoperable formats and why it matters in decentralized systems. The ethos of building protocols and not products is meant to ensure no single entity can write the rule books in their favor, so that would, could result in lock-in or toll extraction. Questions are, how do we build interop into decentralized systems? And specifically, which interoperable formats are critical for the success of projects like Blue Sky? So when we talk about interoperability and standards, it can happen at many layers. So some of that is alignment in international standards bodies on data models and formats. Um, it can also be permissionless protocols and code governance. And lastly, some of it occurs at the level of coding communities and coders learning from other coders. And frankly, sometimes the fastest way to kickstart a headless development community is to build something useful end to end and out open source it, letting people remix and fork it once it's public. This community voices will focus on interoperable formats and will anchor it into a discussion of DIDs or decentralized identifiers as one example of a format designed to maximize interoperability and portability of identities. So today in particular for the panelists, we have two people heavily involved in decentralized identifier and the related VC or verifiable credential standard. And that is me and Joe Andrew. And then we have three additional architects and builders of these and similar standards. And they'll explain how to combine uh, with other open world models for data uh, using standards like JSON-LD, Trust Atoms, but first, let's introduce the panelists. So I'll go first. And I'm Kim Hamilton Duffy, Director of Identity and Standards at Center Consortium. I've been involved in decentralized identity technology and standards since 2016. And I was uh, formerly for a few years co-chair of the W3C Credentials Community Group, which uh, is behind the uh, incubation and development of a lot of the standards that we'll talk about. And I'm very passionate about privacy, agency, and interoperability, and specifically building the standards protocols and the code to make that happen. First, I'd like to call on Joe Andrew to introduce himself. Joe? Hi, Kim. Thanks for uh, having me. I am the president of West Coast Requirements for a consulting company that helps people figure out requirements for decentralized identity systems. Joe, it's a little difficult to hear you. I'm sorry. Can you perhaps either adjust your mic or sometimes it requires leaving the space and re returning? Um, I will try that because I'm also getting some weird background noise. So I think I can't hear you. Joe, um, I'm going to come back to you. Um, it's really hard to hear you right now. Um, let me go to Mark and uh, Joe, just uh, let us know when you're back and connected. Uh, Mark Foster, can you introduce yourself? Oh, I did not notice Mark's. I don't see him here yet. So, uh, Robert, uh, let me keep going. Please do. Kevin Marks. Hi there. Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfectly. 
Okay, so my background is is from a sort of different but somewhat overlapping community that has been building um, distributed identifiers across the web using um, microformats and the um, the sort of descendant community of that IndieWeb. So the, the original principle of microformats was to use the ex existing web pages. So a URL acts as an identifier for people or things um, on the web. Um, so if I link to your web page, that that's uh, that implies I'm talking about you. In, in, this is sort of the convention that has happened from blogging, and, and effectively is what Twitter uses today, with where, where an app mention ends up being a link to that person. Um, so the the basic is sort of using the native um, HTTP um, links inside HTML to to represent people and things. What we then do is add markup to those pages. Um, that's both human readable and can be parsed to extract um, structured data from that using a technique we call microformats, which uses the um, class um, property of HTML elements and defines a, a, vocab uh, a vocabulary for parsing those to, to extract um, structured data in JSON form from that. And that's used um, to basically distinguish between a post or um, uh, a, a, a card about a person or an event and so on. Um, and then we extend this with, with IndieWeb with a few more um, protocols that are designed to um, combine these together. So one of those is WebMention. That is a, a protocol that's where you say this page is connected to you. So you have an endpoint on your site, which is the WebMention endpoint, and you post to that the source and the target, and then you, you can then go and read the, the source and see what it's what it's said about your your post. So that's how you can convey a like or a reply or an RSVP or whatever to the, the, the previous page. And then we have another protocol, Micropub, which is designed to allow you to post to a page. Um, and that uses um, uh, usually an OAuth-based authorization to, to get that, which we can go into detail if we need to. But basically, you then you can then post, you can have tools that will post to a page and you can construct things out of that. So the combination of the sort of the feed of posts on the page and a feed reader, you can then respond to that with a um, with a micro post and, and then that would then send a web mention to the other site to show that you reply to it. So we basically built up the effectively the feature set of modern Twitter, but distributed across um, multiple different implementations and different websites. Fantastic. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, next, uh, well, actually, before calling on Harlan, I'm going to ask, um, it looks like Joe Andrew is back as a listener. Um, can we promote him to speaker, please, and see if it works better this time? But uh, while that's happening, I'm going to call on Harlan to introduce himself. Hello, everybody. Super happy to be here um, on the Interop panel. I'm really passionate about Interop. Um, we're building a project called Core Nexus, which is a decentralized social network with a focus on regenerative projects. And it's not just another silo. We're, we're intending, like even the, in the decentralized world, we see a lot of de facto silos. But our intention is really to bring together a unified dashboard of the next generation projects and networks. And so to that end, Interop is extremely important on a number of levels. Um, identity, also trust, and we've been building um, we've been building a format called Trust Graph over the years, uh, which we'll probably get into, um, hopefully get into some in this session, which is a really simple format for communicating trust across networks, communicating. Um, ratings in a simple way that is um, that is uh, that brings interoperability, and ultimately, what I'm passionate about, like in the blue sky future, is um, is the monolithic skyscrapers of that we see today with the platforms today giving way to a topology that's more like mycelial networks. And a lot of these next generation projects coming together to form potentially a network effect that's greater than any one single platform can have. 
So I'll leave it there for now and looking forward to getting into the discussion with uh, all these great minds. Fantastic. Thank you. And next we're going to try Joe, Joe Andrew. Okay. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, uh, I don't know if you heard my first part, but I, I run a small consulting firm that does uh, requirements engineering for decentralized identity systems. I am the editor of the DID use cases documents, the VC, which is a verifiable credential use case document, a companion technology. And I helped develop the DID method rubric, which is a set of criteria that you can use to evaluate different DID methods to try and understand which one is best for your use. Um, and my engagement here is largely that I, I see cryptocurrencies and other decentralized technologies putting private public key cryptography in most people's hands. Um, and when people have access to that kind of technology, we're going to shift the structure of applications, not only on the web and social media, but how we access our homes and our cars. And I'm trying to help people figure out how to do that in a way that enhances um, human freedoms and human dignity rather than creating architectures of surveillance capitalism or other kinds of uh, power dynamics where the technology vendors uh, kind of uh, run our run our lives in some ways. Fantastic. Thank you, Joe. And Mark will be joining us in a few minutes, it looks like. Um, but why don't we go ahead and dive in? We have a lot of interesting fodder for today's discussion. And the ultimate goal of this discussion that will follow in a Q&A is to talk about what is interoperability in the context of Blue Sky. Today's panel is talking about interoperable formats specifically. And to get us started, I wanted to call on Joe to talk about decentralized identifiers or DIDs and verifiable credentials and how that's relevant. Joe, sorry, that's you. Ah, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, so I want to talk about how to think about DIDs. So DIDs are, um, they are URLs, so they are a string of characters um, that can be used to identify subjects, just like a name or a label. Um, statements using the same DID are taken to be about the same subject. So in general, any place that you might use a URL, you could use a DID. Um, assuming the software is uh, has adopted that technology. So we still have some adoption curves, but the DID is just this string that is a URL. Every DID resolves to a unique DID document. And that document contains the cryptographic material and service endpoints for verifying actions taking on behalf of that DID. So the most common cryptographic material is just a public key. So it leverages public private key material. Um, so you could, for example, use that DID and the key in that DID document to verify a cryptographic signature or to authenticate into an application. And this DID and DID document pattern allows a level of indirection between the identifier and the cryptography so that you can do things like rotate the keys without invalidating the identifier. If you were to use public keys in this pattern or a hash of public keys, which is common in crypto, um, then rotating the keys would in fact invalidate that public key. So that's sort of the first big idea with DID. Um, the third element is that DID methods define how you use a DID. So each DID, within the string itself contains a method ID and it specifies how you create, read, update, and deactivate DIDs of that particular method. So each method has different techniques. It uses different underlying verifiable data registries to manage the current state of the associated DID documents. So some methods use Bitcoin as the registry. Some use uh, Ethereum or IPFS. Um, did key actually uses the did string itself as a registry. It's kind of innovative. And the type of that VDR, that verifiable data registry, is up to each method to define. There are software components called resolvers and registrars, and they perform the method-specific algorithms for performing those CRUD operations. So resolvers turn DIDs into DID documents based on the current state of the VDR. So a resolver that can handle a Bitcoin method is going to know how to talk to Bitcoin. Um, this is typically the first step in, in using the DID that is provided by a user. The other piece of software uh, in that stack is the registrar, 
which converts the cryptographic material provided by uh, the end user software to interact with that VDR and to save the state of the DID document. So each VDR is maintaining its own state. This is the second big idea. This variability across DID methods allows innovation and user choice in determining which approach is best. If you don't like Bitcoin for some reason, you prefer Ethereum or you don't like Ethereum, you, it is part of the choice architecture to have these different kinds of DID methods. There are currently over 130 DID methods, each with different design trade-offs. Um, you can see the current list of W3 registered DIDs at um, diddirectory.com. That's a service my company runs. It's, it's just a convenience built on top of the W3C uh, registry. And to help decide which DID method to use, we developed the DID method rubric, which is a note published by the W3C. Um, we'll have a URL in the show notes. And that provides a curated set of criteria for evaluating and comparing methods. So you can make an apples to apples comparison. You, you pick a set of criteria you care about and you can evaluate bit, the, a Bitcoin method or an Ethereum method and see um, uh, head to head on which criteria that you care about how these different methods score. So this all comes together in sort of at a high level architecture in four major components. Um, and I don't, I don't know if I wanna do this left to right or top to bottom, but I'll, I'll go top to bottom. At the top are applications, which use DIDs to refer to people and things and to verify actions taken on behalf of, of DIDs, such as authentications and assertions. So these applications could be banking, they could be messaging, could just be a website. I mean, it's, it's completely open-ended. In the middle row is, is this interface of did, did documents, resolvers, and registrars. At this layer, the, we are connecting the apps to the verifiable data uh, registries, which are below, abstracting the details of Bitcoin or Ethereum or IPFS or whatever, so that it's easy for the apps to use DIDs without needing to understand how those registries actually operate internally. Um, and at the bottom are these verifiable data registries. These are sovereign systems that manage the individual DID document states. And I don't mean sovereign in the sense of um, SSI or self-sovereign identity. I mean sovereign in the sense that they don't listen to anyone else. <laughs> They're gonna do what they do the way that they do it. And within their context, they're in charge of their own state, right? Bitcoin's gonna do what Bitcoin's gonna do. Um, IPFS is gonna do what IPF is gonna do. Um, and even verifiable data registries that might be completely centralized, like MasterCard um, has registered a method called did ID. It's completely centralized. And in that, MasterCard's verifiable data registry doesn't need to, to get permission from anyone else. Now, that's the sense in which they are sovereign. And so it's the a fourth component, wallets, which provides the connecting glue between all of these. So they interact with the other three components to realize the user's intention. So the wallets are controlled by individuals and they support different DID methods. So they, the wallets know how to work with resolvers and registrars and then know how to create and update DIDs. And they provide those DIDs to applications. And different wallets have different approaches, um, but they, typically either store, well, it's not typically, some of them store the keys directly, some of them externalize the stores into key stores, um, such as in a hardware wallet or in a key vault in the cloud. So the wallet is the one that's standing between the private cryptographic information and the use of the public interactions using the public part of the cryptographic information. Um, so th it's these four components together that allow applications to use DIDs and their DID documents to verify actions on behalf of DIDs without needing to manage the state of those identifiers themselves. So in some sense, this is a path to getting rid of passwords without having a phone home architecture with, with like an OAuth style dependencies on particular identity providers. So we've gotten rid of the middleman um, and yet also still externalize this identity management or this identifier management so the applications can just do what they do best and rely on the rest of the system to deal with this verifiability based on how cryptography works.
So in this sense, these identifiers are decentralized from both apps and what used to be called identity providers, and yet we still can verify actions taken on behalf of those identifiers. Um, that's basically how DIDs work. I know that was pretty fast. We'll have some time for questions, but that's that's my introduction. Great, thank you. And um, everyone note that we have some pinned tweets um, in the spaces. And so um, in those pinned tweets, you can see some of the links for the specs that Joe was referring to. I'm gonna do things a little bit out of order than what I was anticipating, but I wanna, I noticed we have uh, Mark, um, Mark, uh, Foster, I think you got his last name right. Uh, yes, and um, I wanted to ask him to introduce himself. But um, after that, Mark, can you talk about some uh, data model standards protocols that you see as especially relevant in the context of interoperable formats, specifically relevant to Blue Sky? Uh, and welcome, Mark. Uh, please introduce yourself and uh, let us know what you're thinking. Sure. Thanks for introduction here. Um, I'm glad to join the panel. Joe, you couldn't have said it better. I mean, decentralized IDs are, are a huge player in this. And, you know, the core thing to remember is that uh, the RDF format and formats of the web, they go all the way back to the version one of the web, are moving forward. And JSON-LD is a bridge to that. So semantics are very important on how things relate, you know, and that's some of the core driving factors of verifiable credentials and did. So, you know, these interoperability formats are going to be very important moving forward if we're going to have a, you know, a, a, you know, a future social network that has capabilities tied to it that's distributed. And then it's distributed out across different algorithms like XOR and uh, proximity blooms, et cetera, which is, you know, some of the things that Aaron is working on, of course. But uh, <clears throat> when you have something that is interoperability, interoperable across the stores, you know, people can pick and choose what their storage provider is. It could be something decentralized, like a peer-to-peer -peer database, or it could be a traditional uh, data store that we're used to, which is Amazon servers, or, you know, or or it could be a, uh, you know, a blockchain database or an IPFS or, or something, but it's agnostic. But the point is to be able to interchange data uh, across those networks is very important, but also to link up capabilities across like instance for like projects like you can and distributed capabilities so we can control our data, but also provide an ecosystem of truth uh, that could be linked up to, you know, Trustcraft, which is Har which Harlan is working on. And then other projects, which I've been involved with were solid. Okay. So I kind of came and started this whole ecosystem introduced into the decentralized web through solid because what Tim Berners Lee is doing over in that, in that ecosystem is a lot of the core things that, or some of the things that, you know, started from RDF. So all these things need to be backwards compatible and forward com compatible. You know, and I'll talk about, you know, the importance of some of the modern day developers. They're so used to using JSON and, and RESTful APIs. So JSON linked data is a good interoperability format for developers. And I think it's very important to to adhere to what, you know, the, the newer generation wants, but also be backwards thinking. So I think these backwards thinking moving forward, scenarios are very important to take the old web forward and move to the future internet, which is something that I talk about at futureinternet.io, or I'm going to. Actually, it's a holding page where I'm just linking out to documents, but you know, there's a lot of research that I've been doing on my end, and then I got introduced to Blue Sky Web, I think, through a tweet or something like that, and I was like, wow, they're doing all the things, but they're bringing it together. So the Blue Sky Web project here is a key place to learn about all these things, but you know, the formats that I really want to focus on are RDS, JSON, LD, semantics, how that relates back uh, to other things that are going to be important to social networking moving forward. So that's kind of a gist of what I'm saying. There's a lot of other projects that I've worked on. You know, I have a project called LDUX that's geared around the user experience. And, you know, and so we, we need a user experience, too, that people enjoy to use or, and, or it's enjoyable to use, but also has interoperability of the way it looks and feels, right? So one of the projects I've been looking at is is linking up through JSON LD is tokens, uh, design tokens because it's very important on uh, you know the user experience, right? So for in order for these technologies to take off, the user experience is vital. 
Uh, and then to have all these trust factors that are linked back to decentralized IDs and the verified credentials, you could, you know, a real world case scenario could be, of course, I know people have heard this scenario before, but, you know, you could go to the DMV, the DMV in the future could could have a all your personal identifiable information as far as like your social security number. Uh, then you have other places like the, uh, you know, the social security office, which has your social security number, but they can house that data on their servers, but then verify to some kind of human readable DID or some com human readable ID that's linked up to a, D a DID. In my case, it would be in foster.io, which right now just resolves to a, um, to a solid pod where I put some data in there about me, but it's also connected up to activity streams. So what I've done in the blue sky web is I've built a little, little example, hello world example that, you know, it, it, some of it's in Python and it's, it, it's basically uh, a public credential key that I'm able to cross post from solid to Mastodon and from Mastodon back to solid. So that's very important to, I, I think, some of the goals for the uh, you know activity streams. And these are all driven by linked data. So, you know, JSON LD is what I push so hard. It's like even on the pop-up on feature internet, I say at context matters because at context is the key of machines understanding one another, but also humans understanding their intent. So intent is always is always important to anything that we do in any social engagements that we move that we move forward to, but we need to be able to trust the systems also as well. So, you know, control of that data, you know, back to the user and con protecting privacy is very important as well. But, you know, I know I kind of went in a big loop there, but, you know, the main thing is, is RDF formats, linked data that can create federated queries, right? So friend of a friend is, you know, I got some, you know, some examples that are connected to solid, you know, Ruben Verbo and some of the other the other Ruben uh, over there in that group. I got a little Hello World example which shows friend of a friend. We can do a, a query through linked data fragments, which is all, you know, RDF format. But there's a JSON LD version of it that also as well that can drive drive that side of it. So it's backwards compatible, forwards compatible, uh, semantic in relationships of people, places and things, you know, because you think about graph databases and then imagine a, a little fraction, a little segments of data that are fragments that link back and back to the original creator. So one of the things to think about too is starting local first, okay? But you know, some of the things I've been paying attention to are like the confidential data storage. So imagine, uh, and this all comes down to the Identity Foundation, which is the driving some of the driving factors of of DIDs. You know, Microsoft's involved in several people. You know, and it's a huge group, an organization. But you have projects like the Ion. Which all, is all did, it, it, which is based off blockchain, and it's all did driven, right? So, the concept of uh, the confidential data storage would be kind of like you have these encrypted data vaults where, you know, you would have something that was tied to like a human, like a HID, like a human input device, right? And then you would create your content or write something that you want to keep personal. It would start local first, or it could be a tweet, or 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 it could be a a post on a, some other social network that, that kind of goes up and out, right? So in, in other words, it originates from you, but you can encrypt it locally before it hits the internet. And then once it gets out to the internet, it doesn't matter where it's stored. It could be on a CDN, it could be on, you know, Amazon server, it could be on, you know, IPFS or decentralized database, a peer-to-peer -peer database. It doesn't matter. It's kind of agnostic, but it links back the capabilities to the origination of that that content which is you and it's all about self-sovereign identity as well and linking that up you know to so agnostically to like you know what joe was talking about like blockchain technologies like um bitcoin and ethereum and other ones that you know that are leaders in the space i don't know all of them but you know i focus on the major players here but you know anybody can participate so you could you could bring your method of choice which i think is great so Fantastic, interoperability, Mark. interoperability drives all that Thank you so much. Sure. And um, you mentioned some uh, some great applications to social media that I want to come back to, uh, specifically around um, RDS, JSON-LD, and sort of graphical representations. And also, I was thrilled to hear your emphasis on user experience. One thing that I do want to do as we talk about is keep the, uh, you know, so as we're moving forward, our our North Star is basically, you know, what is interoperability in the context of Blue Sky? And so I want to make sure, um, you know, as we go into this, that we make it very concrete for um, our listeners. Um, sure. And so let's let me go on. Harlan, um, Mark had mentioned uh, Trust Graph 
And I was interested in hearing about that and any other uh, sort of relevant interoperability formats that you think are relevant here. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, thanks for the <clears throat> mention, Mark, and really amazing to hear more about the prototyping that you're doing. Um, <clears throat> prototyping and research, I'm a kind of relentless prototyper myself, you know, for the last 10 years or so, been just making kind of demo after demo um, of trust systems, also information visualization and navigation systems. And <clears throat> all of those are coming together in our big project. But yeah, let me dive into Trust Graph a little bit. Um, I'll start by saying that Trust Graph is one of three decentralized trust formats that I'm tracking. Probably better thought of actually as a trust interop format uh, or a trust interchange format. One of three that I'm tracking that are more or less compatible with each other. And those are TrustGraph, TrustNet, and IETF Reputons. Um, <clears throat> to be honest, we probably wouldn't have built TrustGraph uh, if IETF Reputons had been a thing um, at the time when we started. But <laughs> having said that, it's really cool to see these projects come to the same conclusions independently. And effectively, those conclusions in summary are that the core things that you need and want for interoperation of reputation, um, reputation and ratings, I'll say uh, very broadly, because these are modeled as ratings, um, <clears throat> is a subject an object, of course. Someone is doing uh, the rating and someone is, is the rater, is the uh, subject, uh, sorry, the object of the rating. Um, so I rate uh, Kim Hamilton Duffy uh, in, in the area of, um, of decentralized tech um, or something more specific, let's say DIDs um, or DID expertise. There's a good example. And so the DID expertise is the third thing. Beyond the subject and object, we have some kind of semantic data, some kind of area that the person is being rated. And then the fourth thing, the fourth and final thing, is a scalar. Um, so just some kind of numeric value. You know, I, uh, you know, uh, sky's the limit. I, I rate uh, Kim, you know, 100% um, on this, you know, or, um, <clears throat> you know, or another friend of mine, I, I rate highly in the area of Thai food. And then if suppose we had, you know, a decentralized microblogging system like the one that um, Kevin Marks is pointing to, and I love the idea that, um, you know, through microformats, we could all just post independently on, on you know, HTML, indie web style websites and form a foundation of, you know, a next generation Twitter, you know, that's also interoperable uh, with, with next generation social networks. Um, and suppose that uses one of these um, rating formats, then the people that I follow in the area of cuisine and the people that I follow in the area of decentralized web, you know, maybe my decentralized web friends have really bad taste in food, um, just as an example, or my food friends don't know much about technology. I don't necessarily want to see the things that they're posting in those other areas, but I very much want to see those posts in the areas where I directly trust people. So you can see a lot more of our thinking at uh, trustgraph.net. Um, there's some open source code on GitHub at github.com slash trustgraph. And generally speaking, this is, in my vision, this is really a foundation for next generation search and curation and um, you know, just has the potential to solve a lot of our biggest issues, um, you know, things like fake news, uh, for example, and a lot of the really distressing societal things that are going on. Also, last words here um, is it also has the potential to solve um, the sort of your feed being inundated with uh, scammers and spammers and, you know, people that you really don't want there. Well, if they're not in your direct trust graph, or your second or third level trust graph, you just don't have to see them. 
in in this kind of system. So I'll leave it there for now. Thanks, Kim. That was that was fantastic, uh, Harlan. There, you mentioned a few themes, and I want to tag them as things to come back to um, problems of spammers and scammers. Um, and, you know, one thing that I find really exciting about standards like decentralized identifiers is the concept of mutual authentication or mutual trust. Um, you know, right now we, we log into systems, we get texts, um, we get phishing attacks, and it's, um, you know, it's easy to find us. It's harder for us to know who we're interacting with online. Um, the other area that you mentioned that was really interesting is, and Harlan, can you mute yourself, please? Of course, sorry. Um, is that the community, uh, all these different communities converging on some uh, set of standards like decentralized identifiers? Um, you know, I came into it from uh, education, lifelong learning, uh, worker, learner sorts of credentials, including micro credentials and skills and competencies. And so, I was uh, delighted to hear that, uh, you know, the blue sky crowd was was looking into them. And I think we're all sort of coming at it from a different angle, but it's really exciting to see this convergence. And so, Kevin, we're saving the best for last leading up to you. Um, I know you have a lot of very um, relevant projects that you have been focusing on in mic micro formats. Uh, social working group, indie web protocols. And I wanted to just call on you to talk to some of the uh, interoperable formats and uh, related efforts that you find especially useful uh, to this discussion. Well, I've been working on some of this stuff for, for a long time. Um, what we found um, with the sort of, with the microformats model and the indie web model was that it's, um, the importance of standardization is more about documentation than legislation. So you don't write the standard first and then encourage people to implement it. You build some things and come with come up with the areas of agreement that you overlap and you document that, and that becomes the standard. Um, and there's a if the the microformats um, process document sort of defines this, where it says the first thing to do is don't start writing a standard. The first thing to do is go out and look and see what other people are doing and find the commonalities between that and write that down instead, because there's there's a there's a, a temptation to write the, the biggest possible thing that encompasses everything. Um, and we've tried to sort of not try and do it that way around, but to start with, you know, the smallest thing we can, we can, we can define and then grow it from that and build a bunch of um, sort of small point to point protocols that connect things rather than a, um, something that tries to encompass the whole world. And that's you know I know there's you know, there, there are different kinds of approaches to that, but, the, but that's that's sort of been the model we've had. And the other part of it is that we we very much build on existing um, DNS and web rather than building new kinds of resolvers. I, and I know that's, that's sort of a different approach from a lot of people on on this these projects because they've they're excited about different kinds of resolvers. But our focus is mainly about how we augment the web rather than replace it. Um, so. I did mention some of the some of the um, the technical pieces of that. It's it's sort of it's this is a very hard thing to do in, in an audio medium. To be honest, There's these, a lot of these things work better when, when you've got something to, to show as well. But the um, sort of the, the the key idea is to think about the web as we use it and augmenting that such that there's a bit more information embedded within the page rather than. Um, having a sort of parallel structure for that. And then in the same way that, um, and the interoperability part is is part of, you know, there's a there's a trend at the moment to, um, there's, there's, there's something that calls itself Web3, which isn't really the web. Um, and if they understood the web, they wouldn't try and put version numbers on it because the point of the web is that it's consistent and it will keep lasting for a while and we add new pieces to it rather than trying to replace it. And that was, there was a sort of a big schism in the web um, well, 15 years ago now when there was an attempt by W3C to, to replace the existing web with a new XML-based web. Um, and the pr practitioners got together and defined um, the um, what was then called HTML5, working um, the what working group to, to say, no, instead of replacing the web, we want to keep the web we've got and define how it interoperates better. Um, with, the, with the assumption that a web document, an existing HTML document, should still be readable in, in many years' time. Um, 
and any new additions to that um, should still you know, has has the back battery such that um, things that don't understand that will see the, the the bits that they do understand. That's that's sort of a, a deep principle of um, of web design. Um, and yeah, as, as other people have said, this sort of forward back battery stuff is is quite hard to get right. That is a, that is a tricky problem. Um, and the approach that we've taken as as implementers has been to build the pieces that we want to build and then work with each other to try and get them to, to cooperate um, individually. Because we're, you know, we're mostly doing this as, um, as amateurs building our own sites rather than um, working for larger organizations. Thank you so much, Kevin. And so we had a little exercise teed up that I wanna come to and uh, to start making some things more practical we're going to uh, create or give you information to create a did yourself, a decentralized identifier with a tool called godiddy.com that's created by Marcus Sabadello. And you can see in the pins tweets uh, thread that I wrote that describes how to do it. So um, in that thread, you'll see both a video, but then a sequence of steps. Um, and so I encourage you to, to look at that. And if you do that and tweet your did at blue sky underscore commons, then they'll retweet the first 20. Um, Joe, I think while we have people looking into that, I thought it might be good to talk to um, what's happened. I'll, I'll start talking to what's going on um, in the steps, but then I'd like to tee you up to also add any um, details about the concepts that we're looking at. So uh, let me just start saying some of the steps out loud. Um, first, we start by going to godiddy.com and um, you enter your email address, but it sends you a, it sends you a sign in link. And to create a did, we're just gonna create a simple did key did. And you go to manage dids, create. And the, the uh, pinned tweet has more details if you're missing anything. Um, we're gonna go through a path that lets you see the private key for the did. So the private key is the thing that lets you prove control over this magic string or did. So um, there's an interface, just skip that did document part for now. We'll come back to that. We'll have Joe describe some of what's going on there. And we'll just scroll down to the part that says method option secret. So we're gonna create the very simplest uh, did method type. So the one called key or did key. And so click that button, go down and say create did. And then scroll back up to the top of that page and click on the request response. So say if you were wanting to uh, then use this did, um, say to authenticate, to sign statements, and there, there are some nuances to what I'm saying, but basically you will need this private key or you'll see this um, if you click on request response, in that registrar response. If you look in that JSON data, you'll see this field private key JWK. And that is the private key material that you need to basically sign statements proving control over that did. Um, there's a lot of other stuff in that document, but one other thing I wanna show you before we move on. Hold on, is, Tim. Yeah. I wanna make a comment about the private key JWK here. So these Perfect. private keys, Generally, you never want them to leave the machine they're created on. That's the best practice. But backup for backup reasons, you may need to. And so when we first thought through how do we teach folks to, to make a did real quick, it was like, well, what wallets do people have? Because wallets are the gatekeepers to those secrets. So it's fairly unusual that a web key, a private key would be shared in an HTML page um, in this fashion. So this really is a debugging tool. So for those of you who are more security minded and wondering why these private keys are on this web page, um, it is precisely because it's an educational tool. 
Thank you very much for adding that very important detail. And I mentioned in the uh, in the tweet thread some additional details there. But yes, this is just a debugging tool. And um, it might be good to chime in and ask, why did we pick this tool? Um, when we started out this session, we had a, a goal of how do we get a bunch of people to generate their own data in under five minutes? So fortunately, Marcus Sabadello had this uh, free open tool that we could use that would let people see it. Everything else that we considered involved command line tools or installing some kind of library that we thought were kind of prohibitive for, for a fast, for a big audience. So um, that's why we're going this path is to educational purposes. And so um, the last thing I want to demonstrate is in Joe's part, he talked about dids and did strings, but he also talked about did documents. So we're still, if you're still on the page of uh, registrar response, you'll see this uh, did state did, and there's a string there that looks like did colon D colon. Um, so whether you're on that screen or if you're back on manage dids, you'll see that string did colon key colon, et cetera. So you can copy that string and in go diddy, go to resolve dids, enter that did, in that text box, click resolve did. And then in the response, you will you can click on the tab that says did document. And that's the did document, which is this other um, data model uh, that is, has a, W3, a corresponding W3 standard described in the did data model. And this is the document that allows all of these different did methods, did key, did V1 did BTCR to um, understand or to, to use the same backing data model, implement the decentralized identifier functionality, their create, read, update, delete operations differently, but also have a, a format that everyone can understand and makes it, makes it interoperable. Um, Joe, are there any other details that you'd like to add on the uh, did document? Absolutely. I want to point to a couple of things. So for one, this did document is um, using JSON LD. And so the comments made earlier about the at context, you can see there are three values in the at context. Um, the first one is what lets us know that the properties in here mean the properties as defined in the did core spec. And then we have two additional security related contexts for the ED25519 expression of this key and for the X255 one nine expression of that key. So that's pulling in this magical JSON LD that lets us in a rigorous way, in the way that RDF likes to um, formally define terms using a, a fully qualified URL, that lets us really understand that these terms are what we think they are. The other thing I wanna point out is that these did documents are primarily um, for storing and, and revealing verification relationships and verification methods. They're also good for service endpoints, but in the control architecture of how we participate in decentralized systems, um, it's the first two that I think are most often confusing. There are five verification relationships in this document. So there's a, a um, well, actually, I don't know what this verification method is, that's new. So that's interesting. Um, but authentication, assertion method, capability delegation, capability invocation, and key agreements are five verification relationships that you can then, using the verification methods defined in those relationships, you can uh, uh, verify actions taken, for example, at an application. Um, so authentication would be how you log in. Assertion method would be how you sign um, uh, cryptographically capability delegation invocation are related to capabilities. I don't want to get too much into that. And then key agreement is how you sign documents. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, key agreement is how you um, encrypt and decrypt. Um, so those, those five different fundamental operations are what can be verified with um, these these standard verification relationships. And the verification methods, in this case, we have two. Um, uh, that's why I was confused. So the first verification method here is of type ED25519 verification key 2020. And then that is referred to um, by reference in the properties for authentication, assertion method, capability, delegation, capability, invocation. So those four 
verification relationships use that first verification method. And then the key agreement use one that is um, defined in line. So those are two different ways that you can specify which verification method. Both of these are basically saying, hey, you're going to use this public key to do to perform this verification. Um, so to my sense, that's really how the magic of DIDs provides this interoperability for these five different kinds of activities. Thank you, Joe. And you mentioned something that I actually find um, might excite and motivate people out there. So um, when he was talking about verification method and, and um, you know, he didn't recognize it, it's really interesting because Joe is actually one of the authors of the spec, I believe. <laughs> and um, so I think that in, in this isn't um, this uh, this doc, this did spec has changed dramatically um, since we first well, people were working on it far before my involvement in this space, the what we thought the did spec could do the sort of um, functionality ascribed to it or what it's responsible for um, has changed dramatically since I first got involved in it. And so I think that's really that really points to how new all of this is. And so, you know, despite if if we're talking and implying that any of this is uh, sort of very advanced and super baked, um, you know, well, the, the did, did spec is just recently a, a V1 uh, standard, um, or through the double, or actually, yeah, I, I take that yet. back. Not I yet. Take back. I take that back. <laughs> uh, we won't go into that. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it's recently ready for, uh, for voting. And so, um, you know, I think that that is an element that makes it a really exciting place to be in right now, this and, you know, all of this, the standards that will be built on that, um, you know, this is just basically the, the brick, you know, a basic brick that is needed and put, uh, putting the big building together. And so that's what we're all here working on. And if that kind of work excites you, um, I think it's a really great and active community. And so any of us can help get you in touch with, um, with who you want to, uh, uh, with, with how to get involved. Um, the last thing I want to say, just to make um, this more precise, because we have been very in low level details, is that so when you look at this, you have a did string, you have this did document. Great. The question is, what can you do with that? So Joe talked to us about, um, you know, s some of the things you can do with it. So you you have a did and you know how to pull out that did uh, the private key to prove control over your did. So what can you do with it then? So that's a way that you can use to authenticate. So like, um, you know, uh, some effort or a related effort people may be familiar with is login with Ethereum. The same principle is happening there. Um, Joe talked about the assertion method. So that's something that you could use to uh, sign a verifiable credential. So say something in Harlan's example of a credential uh, verifiable credential he issued to me saying um, politely that he thinks that I know a lot about DIDs. Um, so he could sign that verifiable credential um, with this DID key. And then that would show that, um, you know, that would, uh, he could, uh, I could later then go um, take that, that credential around and someone else can verify and say, yes, that's Harlan's uh, did key. And Joe, I see that you have your hand raised. Hi, thanks. Um, I just want to know, uh, because we haven't said it yet, these uh, DIDs are not meant to be human friendly and neither is the did document. So um, the, for those who might be familiar with Zuko's triangle, which is you can be decentralized, you can be secure, or you could be human friendly, pick two. So the, the DID community picked decentralized and secure, which means we really don't expect individual users to ever really see DIDs, except if they're in a debugging mode or a verification mode where they're like, hey, this thing's not working. Aren't I using something I understand? For the most part, the applications and the wallets should hide the complexity that we're exposing to you right now. So even though it's kind of overwhelming and, and, and maybe hard to understand, hopefully the end users will never even know this is going on under the hood. Fantastic. Thank you, Joe. And um, so as expected, the um, 
I and the other panelists probably nerded out a bit too much on um, the specs. And we have we had a bunch of other topics that we have lined up that we thought we would get to, but um, it's getting close to time to the Q&A. So what we'll do is I'm going to, um, let's see, I'm going to wrap up this phase and call on each speaker to um, provide some closing remarks in anticipation of the Q&A. And let me see one second. And what we'll do in the Q&A is um, we'll take questions from the audience. And if you have questions, you can go ahead and um, do so by raising your hand. And then uh, we'll call on you to ask your question. So let me come back to this. Oh, yeah. And so one last thing before we go forward, um, just a reminder that if you created a did using GoDiddy or whatever other tool, you can tweet your did at uh, Blue Sky Commons. It's underscore in between. And the first 20 um, will be retweeted. Okay, so now we're going to do some closing remarks, and I'm going to go in the order of uh, Kevin, Harlan, Joe, and Mark. Okay, uh, Kevin, you're first. Any closing remarks? Um, well, my, my, my remarks will be, if you're interested in what I've been saying, the best place to go and read more about it is IndieWeb.org. There's a um, sort of introduction page there and there's also um, a, a, a lot of linked wikis and discussions about how we've used these different um, things to, to build distributed um, pub publishing and posting at the moment um, and there's or, or there's chat.indieweb.org if you wanted to ask people about it because that's connected together in a bunch of different ways but the you know the, the, we, we, we're sort of in some ways, we, we, we've take, we've taken the approach the other way around, which is we, we're building building first and documenting later, um, and that a lot of that documentation is, is going on in, in, in that wiki, um, and then that spreads out to standards bodies as we as we get things more firmed up. So the things that end up as W three standards um, come have have come from that work, um, and yeah, I'd hope I hope to see hope people there. Thank you. And yes, we'll be able to get to some more topics, I hope, in the Q&A. So I think we have about an hour reserved for that. So I invite the panelists to stay on if, if possible, and we'll be able to get more into some of the topics we didn't get to. Harlan, I'm going to call on you next. Closing remarks? Okay, great. Thanks, Kim. Um, yeah, I think the main uh, thing I want to say at the end is that um, you know there are a lot of interop areas that are crucial for building next generation social networks that interoperate with each other. And the things we commonly think about are identity, single sign-on, transferring data um, between networks. Some of the ones we less commonly think and talk about are reputation, um, which I talked a bit about. And another is the ability to curate collections across network boundaries. Um, so that I can see and collect and share and remix collections of things that came from different networks. And the last one I want to mention is um, permissions and uh, especially the object capabilities model, um, which is getting some love from the ZCAP. Um, the ZCAP LD uh, spec in particular is a really interesting way to share object capability permissions across networks. Um, if you want to learn more about TrustGraph, go to TrustGraph.net. Um, CoreNexus is the nascent uh, decentralized social network project we're working on. That's at CoreNexus.io. And just really a pleasure to be here with all of you. Thank you. And Joe, any closing remarks for, for this por portion? Yes. So first, I want to echo Mark's last comment. It's been great being on this panel. I, uh, I have a lot of respect for the work that my fellow panelists are doing. So go check that out. Um, I also want to give a shout out to um, two resources. One I already mentioned, the diddirectory.com. If you simply append a slash uh, method name, 
Um, so, for example, did directory.com slash btcr. That's probably the easiest way that you can get to the method spec for any did method. So that's a nice convenience. Uh, it's free. It's just a service we put up to make it easy. And the other one is a podcast that we do called The Rubric. Um, which interviews the creator of did methods. And so that's another way to, you know, on your next jog or whatever, or workout or nap, um, uh, check out the podcast. Uh, we interview folks in it about did methods and, and I like it. I think you might like it too. Yes, especially check out, uh, I'll recommend two. One is did BTCR, which is close to my heart. And the other one is did snail, which I'm very eager to check out. People uh, love it. It's a did uh, through the postal service. So who knows how that works? Um, Mark, and lastly, Mark Foster, um, any closing remarks for this section? Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, I appreciate all this conversation. This is great. And Joe, you, you brought up uh, human readable, uh, which is going to be important moving forward. So I think some of the discussion we need to probably move forward is figuring out how to make these uh, decentralized IDs, keep them, like you said, away from the user so they don't have to be, you know, of course, this is all nerd stuff. Okay? But, you know, linking these up to human readable formats will probably be a, a, a huge step. So I'm interested to learn more about that and then uh, and get feedback from what people are, are thinking about on that topic. So that's an important thing that I'm interested in. And I think we need to probably discuss that moving forward as a group at some point. But also I will be sharing go diddy with all my developer friends to get them introduced to to dids and i do appreciate all the work on building this user experience which is very handy so i don't have to open a, a, a command prompt to show them how it works so i really do appreciate all the work that everybody's doing in this space and i look forward to the the future conversations moving forward Fantastic. And I should give a special sp uh, shout out to Marcus Sabadello and his uh, handle is Peacekeeper for developing GoDiddy. And he's just done tremendous work in this space for many years. You'll see his name on many of the specifications. And, um, you know, he was, uh, as far as I know, the originator of the idea of uh, Universal Did Resolver and, and um, really pushing that forward. So um, he's just a tremendous contributor to the community. And so as we were closing off this section, um, I heard some great emergent themes from um, what the panelists were talking about. So, you know, some of them were just kind of interesting ideas that maybe the community would like to learn more about. That includes uh, Harlan referred to Z caps. Kevin referred to this concept of documentation. I think he said documentation, not legislation. I found that really interesting because that sort of captures um, how a, 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 an approach of progressing and moving towards standards and also mentioning the idea of, you know, developing minimal, uh, or when you say standard, developing minimal uh, sort of pieces that can be mixed and matched together. And so that's one way to think about composability. And um, so we're going to move to the Q&A. And again, if you want, if you have any questions, just feel free to raise your hands. And, um, and I think panelists, I think that applies to you too, if there are any topics that you just want to dive into.